Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today on our webinar. It's, this is Rob Watson from Mackerel Solicitors and I'm here with Gavi Sandu also from Mackerel and Jonathan who's joining us from Hampton Partners. We're going to be discussing selling a tech business, when, why and how and, and going through some of the legal aspects of the process but also how you can get your business ready to sell and the steps you can take to make that process easier. Um, initially, Jonathan's going to talk through uh, what Hamilton do and introduce them and, and how their support in the process can, can help make it all go a bit more smoothly. So I'll, I'll pass over to Jonathan to, to introduce himself and to put his slides up and, and then we'll go from there. Thank you for joining us. Hey, well, hopefully you can all now see the beginning of my slide deck. Um, so, um, my part of this presentation, um, which is entitled Selling a Tech Business, When, Where, Why, How, and all the other words that we use to describe something that's happening. Um, and also, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, thing which is worrying everybody at the moment, which is the impact of COVID-19 on tech filmmaking. Uh, so that's me. I'm the director for the UK at Hamilton Partners. Um, we are a uh, tech firm um, that spec we are an MA firm that specializes in, in uh, selling small tech businesses, usually to larger tech businesses. Um, and this is what I'm going to be talking through, I'll tell you a little bit more about Hamilton, um, take you through some of the external factors which will inform any decision you are likely to make about selling a company. Uh, some of the internal factors are things that you can do uh, to make a difference. I'm going to talk about the process timing. How long does it take to sell a company? What do you need to do? And what effect, if any, COVID-19 has been happening on that? And then, uh, like all good presenters, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I've just told you in recommendations. We're unusual um, for a company that actually offers services to help sell companies um, in that all the people that are uh, directors and uh, principals in the business have actually built and sold their own tech businesses. So um, if you're considering selling the business, that means that we will really understand the pain uh, that you will have to go through in the selling process and more of that later. Um, as you'd expect with technology transactions, most of our transactions are cross-border and predominantly they're actually in EMEA. And most people think in tech in uh, Europe, they're gonna be acquired by an American firm, um, but that's not the case. Most European tech firms sell to other tech firms. Um, and we are absolutely focused on tech. Um, we, don't, we don't care whether the company's privately owned, whether it's an, an entrepreneur-led, whether it's part of a private equity portfolio, whether it's VC-backed companies, but we're interested in selling. Occasionally, we'll look on the buy side. That means helping find targets for companies to buy. And occasionally, we will go, we will sell startups um, if they have very high levels of intellectual property. Um, so let's have a look at some of the external factors which will govern whether it's um, your firm is ready to sell. Um, one of the things that people often don't understand about the technology uh, sales market is that it's, it's crucially tied to the level of the NASDAQ index. And you can see on that graph um, how uh, both transaction volume and aggregates disclosed value on average has pretty much followed that index up. Now, um, in February 2020, if you can remember that long ago, we were still in the largest bull run on record. But then, of course, something happened. And you can see on the wrong, it's some redness there, uh, V-shaped redness, um, which has been a very, very interesting journey for people like me over the last three months. And here's why. Um, as you would expect, when a global pandemic started to hit, or when people became aware of the impact it might have, people panicked. And uh, the NASDAQ slid very, very rapidly over a few weeks. But equally remarkably, it also started to rise again. And three and a half months later, it had staged 100% recovery to its peak. And since that time, in July and August, it's carried on moving upwards. Now that clearly is good news for the technology M&A market. Um, interestingly, 
if you look at the last significant financial downturn in the Nasdaq around the financial crisis of 2008 to 2010, it took the Nasdaq 22.5 months to recover. But this tells us a lot about how much technology has become integrated in the global economy over the last 10 years. It also tells us a lot about how much people expect technology to lead the global economy out of a COVID-driven recession. Um, so for those of you who do own technology companies and are thinking about selling them, one of the things that's happened during the COVID outbreak, um, which is good news for you, is that in global shares of all M&A, TMT, technology, media and telecoms, has increased its share. So in terms of all the volumes and the, the values of the transactions, the action is happening in technology. Despite the fact that overall M&A slowed down very, very quickly when COVID hit. Um, and if only to prove the point about how closely technology M&A follows the NASDAQ, this little graph, this set of graphs that should be pretty instructive. You can see over the last couple of years how M&A has gone up and down in the first two quarters of the year compared to 2020 when the thing bombed in April and May. But as soon as a little bit of confidence uh, came back into the market, and confidence is usually an understanding of what's going on, whether it's good or bad, the uh, average disclosed value of acquisitions shot up, as did the volume. And you can see on the right, we started to get some very big deals coming back um, into, into the marketplace. Um, and also, reassuringly, um, we had a period in May and June, and particularly in May, when the billion dollar plus deals disappeared out of the marketplace. <clears throat> and most of the money was going into smaller deals. What was actually happening at that time is the major technology players were hoovering up very small but IP rich companies um, in order to secure their future and develop technology pathways going forward. What has happened now is that that, that particular type of M&A has become mixed again with geographical and market grabbing M&A where much bigger companies are coming back into play again. So <coughs> as a snapshot right now, things in many ways are back to normal, only a few months after the beginning of the crisis. The other thing which happened early on in the crisis was that financial buyers, and really um, in M&A, most financial buyers are private equity firms. And private equity firms bailed out of the market very, very quickly as soon as they thought there was an increased risk from the pandemic, um, having increased their involvement in tech for some time before. As you can see there, they're very much back in play. Again, another piece of good news if you're considering selling a tech company. And the last thing really that um, is really, really good background for any sellers at the moment is that the number of daily transactions is really back in line with previous years where well, the number of transactions have been high. And this is the sort of thing that's been happening in the last month. You know, really big deals, you know, up to a billion deal with Master Charge with Steady City. Uh, Uber spends another 2.7 billion on Postmates uh, and so on. And some of these ones that are undisclosed will be hundreds of millions, if not billions, contracts that just haven't been uh, exposed. I mean, look at Just Eat and Grub up there. They actually did publish that for 7.1 billion. Um, however, if there's some bad news I want to throw in here, is that clearly there have been some winners and some losers in the COVID epidemic. The good news for technology is there's been many more winners than losers. But if you're in travel or hospitality or supporting event organization, even oil and gas, certainly malls and shopping, uh, and to a certain extent in automotive, Although automotive has been one of the most active areas in MA over the last two years. 
as the motor, motor industry faces um, the change to uh, electric traction, the change maybe to self-driving vehicles, um, but, and also the existential crisis as to whether people are going to be buying cars in the same uh, levels as they did because of environmental legislation and concerns. Um, and what this means is that what we've actually seen is during COVID that in order to underline the fact that most tech has done pretty well, um, doing pretty well during a pandemic means essentially the marketplace holding valuation levels. And that has been true in areas such as um, IT services, uh, extraordinarily in booking platforms, which have dropped down and have come back up again. Um, E-commerce marketplaces have held steady, but areas where there's been a massive increase in consumption, such as collaboration and working tools, and gaming and streaming, valuations have increased. So, you know, while a lot of people are having a very bad time out there, uh, people that have owned companies in that sector have been working flat out, and so the valuations have been increasing. So, you know, that's what's happening in the outside environment. So from having a very, very lumpy few months, we appear to be back to situation normal as far as the technology uh, part of the marketplace is concerned. So what can you do internally if you're thinking about going to market? Well, the first thing to realize is that M&A is part of any normal economic business cycle. And there's an expectation that people will sell out before making full maturity in their company. Um, the reality for anybody who's been through a number of technology cycles is that in order to survive, you have to become the gorilla. You have to become the biggest player to dictate what goes on in the marketplace. You can't do that, you need to occupy a niche. You can't do that, you're in trouble. You need to watch out. We know that activity peaks when disruption accelerates. And these last few slides have been telling us that. Usually it's technological regulatory or high new growth markets coming in, but now we've got significant disruption because of COVID, which will be around for a long time and which will change economies. Um, but it remains the case that large companies have a limited ability to innovate. <clears throat> so they have to acquire to ensure their future. Interestingly enough, the biggest acquisitors are also the largest R&D spenders. There's also profound financial reasons why technology M&A is an everyday occurrence. Um, you get new entrants into tech sectors from traditional industries. A classic example of that would be the recent purchase of Rubicomer, an e-commerce platform by Carrefour, which is the world's biggest supermarket group. So at a stroke, it changed into a, a technology company. The same is true of a product as people think delivers grocery and vans, but actually their major business is consulting uh, to other companies on how to build successful automated warehouses. Um, the truth is that tech companies are still generating mountains of cash. Um, now we've just seen that um, the head of Apple has become the latest millionaire, billionaire today, and that's entirely based on growth in their share price. And interest rates are still low, money is cheap, and share prices are high again. Um, and even before we had this perturbation in the marketplace, financial investors were accumulating record breaking funds have become more and more active in tech and need to spend that money. So if you're just starting to think about going to market, there's, there's some questions you ought to be asking yourself. One of them is, are you at the top of your game? And by that I mean, do you think you are ever going to be as good at running your business ever again? And that can be a function of age, it can be a function of energy, it can be a function of the luck you have encountered in building your business, and many other factors. Is your business on a strong growth curve? Often people start to consider selling the companies at two points. One, when their business is starting to decline. <clears throat> or at the opposite end of the spectrum, when they think they've put a lot, a lot of work into it and it is just about to shoot off, but it needs new ownership to capitalize on that. And therefore, their company is worth 
extra money because of that. Um, neither of those things are true. I'll refer back to what we call hockey stick planning. I think in the next slide or a couple of slides on. Um, but nobody is interested in buying a failing company. And if they are interested in buying a failing company, it would be a very low valuation. If your revenues are not recurring, the sad news is you're likely not to get interest in the marketplace. So you must show <clears throat> that you either have strong repeatable contracts or a properly uh, SAS business. Are you in a winning segment? Are you in that top group I just outlined or are you in the bottom group? Um, and if you're in the top group, that has profound implications, which we'll again go into later. One of the things that's really, really important to understand about your own company is who really owns your IP, particularly if you've been developing open source software. And also, is every process that you've been through in building your business documented, every board meeting, every sales contract, every HR contract, um, your building leases, and so on. The next thing, and this is absolutely vitally important, um, because you don't get this right and you suddenly realize that somebody way on, way into the process decides they suddenly don't want to exit or they suddenly want a different price for the business or they want radically different conditions to which you uh, originally agreed there'll be a lot of people lining up to kill you <clears throat> so you must be absolutely sure that those people who can influence the sale are aligned in what they're thinking should consider whether your shareholding structure is complex. <clears throat> what I mean by that is often fast-growing tech companies um, may have started with a with a lot of shareholders, with a lot of shareholders, you know, family. Um, you know, they may have gone out to get lots of little, little shareholders. If you've got a complex um, shareholding structure, that will mitigate against a sale and certainly a fast sale. So while you're thinking about getting your business uh, ready for sale, it's best to concentrate the shareholding. It makes it much easier to buy. Another thing you need to consider is, is how soon after you've signed the sales and purchase agreement, actually formally sold the company, do you want to exit it? Maybe you've decided you want to form a new, a new career in a new company that has acquired you or run your sector or your segment and grow it. On the other hand, you may be sick to death of it and you may want to exit the moment that agreement is signed and go on to build, build another company. These are important considerations because these will affect the value of, of the company that's buying you. And you must realize that for the most part, technology businesses will be bought in what we call a learn out and you will have to stay around for a certain amount of time and deliver on certain targets. So that being so, you know, is your management team strong, invested in building the business? Um, because it's those people that a potential acquirer will look at because most acquirers believe, whether that's apparent at the time or whatever anybody says, that founders will move on pretty quickly after acquisition. So they want to be sure they've got a team that knows how to run the business in its new home. <clears throat> I would also ask you, if we were having this discussion, is, is can you handle the demands of the process? You know, you spend 120% of your time building that business, you're going to have to put another 120% on top of it, handling the demands of the process. So the best way to handle that is to make sure that one person at least is devoted to handling the sale process and their colleagues are devoted to running the business. Um, other things just to think about is you may have built uh, your business to be a thorn in the side, potentially the next employer or a particular firm that you spotted was ahead in the race to build a new technology segment. Those are people that could be very high on the list of potential acquisitors. Also, as is often the case on the West Coast of America, <clears throat> is it's the ex-employer um, that becomes the natural acquisitor of that company. Um, and you know, Tom Siebel, who built Siebel Systems, did both of those things. You know, he was a thorn in the side of Larry Ellison, who was uh, the founder of Oracle, uh, where Siebel had worked. Um, and it turned out in the end that, you know, despite all the fighting and the slagging off of each other that had gone, gone on, the best acquirer for Siebel was in fact Ellison's Oracle. Um, if you think about creating a target buyer list, 
i.e. the people that you might you think might be interested in your firm. That's usually about 56, 50 or 60 firms. Um, and maybe another 10 private equity buyers. Um, and the way to think about who might want to buy your firm is to think about this, this list, builders, competitors, pivoters, consolidators, aspiring entrants, geographical expanders. They will all want to buy your firm for one or multiple of those reasons. So rather than thinking just about competitors, think about all those people that are trying to change their business and you and your management team can be part of that. If it turns out that the best offers you have are from private equity firms, I would say they need to be tech specialists. There are certainly generalist private equity firms, um, but if I was selling a business again, I'd want to be bought by a tech specialist that really understands the vagaries of the tech business. And essentially, they're going to do two things with you. They're either going to help you build up your business as it is, <clears throat> or they're going to put you together with other businesses that will disproportionately increase your value. But they will always want to sell you off because that's how they get their return. So if you have a strategic buyer bought by somebody else in the industry, unless you screw things up royally, your business is likely to be absorbed into that business over time. With a financial buyer, you may depending on whether you stay around, find yourself with a new owner in a matter of years. I need to consider that. Um, when you get to a transaction process, some of those things that I talked about in, in how to prepare will come into really hard focus. Because during the nine months or so it'll take you to sell the business, <clears throat> things will change. And there are certain things you need to keep a really, really hard look upon uh, if you want to increase the value of your business. And uh, there are things you can do to, to decrease the value of your business or in fact terminate the negotiations. So one of the things you must do during the transition, transaction process is deliver consistent figures. You need to show that you can consistently deliver on your target numbers. If you miss that, that can terminate the process. And unfortunately, I've been in situations where clients have done that. You have to be able to deliver a compelling investment case. You have to be able to produce an excellent management presentation. You have to be able to produce an attractive positioning for your business and describe how that will accentuate the business of any acquiring company. You do want to get multiple bidders because clearly an auction process tends to increase the value that will be attributed to your business and will increase the attractiveness of the offer overall. You need to be able to support a structured due diligence process where every single aspect of how you run your firm will be examined. And you need to demonstrate that your management team is visionary. You can add value in that process. Those little flags are things which an M&A advisory company such as Hampleton can help you with. And clearly, if you're going to pay advisors, you want them to be able to take as much load off you as is possible during the transaction time. But ultimately, there's information that only you can supply. Now, what you really do need to avoid in the transaction process is inconsistent financials, as you'd expect. Um, if you were to come to me with a plan that showed that you were just about to undergo exponential growth, I, I would tell you to go away and come back and do something which shows that you're going to grow at a relatively normal rate. <clears throat> no acquisitor is interested in a company that has not grown and then suddenly claims it's going to grow at, at an exponential rate. If you are losing key employees, that's a real red flag for uh, acquiring business. Don't try and hide it. Um, stop it, um, because you have probably got a structural problem in your company. Uh, the same thing would be true if that your key clients, which are references, and under due diligence, an acquiring company will want to talk to your clients at a later date. If they've disappeared, again, it's a red flag. Never neglect your day-to-day -day operations. 
as I've said before, um, you can't look like you're falling apart during a process and do ensure that you have got agreement as to what each shareholder wants out of a transaction. Don't ever miss your budget and don't have any IP disputes. Again, make sure that all that stuff is understood and settled and buy yourself a good IP lawyer before you even go to market. They're worth their weight in gold. And be prepared to be able to have a structured due diligence. Um, you will be required to put a lot of documents into a secure place so that they can be examined by all the parties involved in the transaction. This is what we call a data room, and it's usually supplied by a third party. Again, the little flag show where an M&A, a good M&A advisory company can take the load from you. So just wanted to go quickly through process timing. How much would this labor of, of, of your love um, take up? So this is how we would characterize a normal transaction process timeline. You might be quite surprised to see just how much time in the process is taken at right at the beginning, preparing your information memorandum, getting your financials displayed in the correct shape, creating the teasers where we would start to go out to talk to the marketplace. Teaser is a descript short description of a company that is anonymous. Uh, an IM is the full description of your company. You know, one might be four pages, the other would be 60. Um, we need to then prepare the target buyer list. It's not just about the companies, it's about who are the decision makers in those companies and how do you get through to them. It's not easy. Most company systems are set up to stop uh, potential sellers getting to talk to buyers, strange though it may seem. I mean, clearly, as we do this every day, we know usually who to talk to, but such is the dynamism of this marketplace. You know, new buyer influences are appearing all the time. And it can take three or four months to complete all the buyer outreach because you are never going to get through to one person one time. You know, we will try everything from phone calls to emails to instant messaging, you know, right through to sending somebody paper via FedEx if that's going to attract their attention and get through their uh, PA or whoever. While we're doing that process, you're likely to be having your initial uh, conversations with the management of interested companies. These have always been done uh, by video link uh, because of time. If you're using WebEx there as a generic, uh, it probably would be Zoom now. Um, and then as, as interest is shown and we can start to sign non-disclosure agreements, access will be given on both sides to common data rooms. Um, again, as we move forward here, that is normally when we'll start to get the physical management meetings, people start flying around. And then in parallel with that almost, we'll be trying to get the letters of intent, I where a company signifies in a written form what they're prepared to pay for a business and, and under what conditions. Not legally binding, uh, but uh, anybody in the industry would consider it to be morally binding. More due diligence follows, and then eventually we have sales and process agreement negotiation. I'm trying to do the fine details. <clears throat> and that is where the auction would come in. So we're going to be spending at least eight months tied together doing that. Now, what effect does COVID have? Well, let's have a look at that. We have found with the mandates we're currently handling that certainly up to about six months and past the su submissions of indications of interest, um, things have been going very smoothly. Where there has been some issues has been with uh, management teams, particularly American ones, who don't particularly want to travel uh, to meetings and are still a little uncomfortable uh, with video conferencing and electronic signature. Um, so our advice, um, if you're in any process, is try and schedule physical meetings as soon as possible. <clears throat> you know, we're in a situation where travel is being eased and then tightened up. You know, try and as soon as you get a, a window to go and see somebody, go and see them. And we don't know whether there's going to be a second wave. It appears there is one in, in Europe. We're seeing third waves coming in the Far East. So you just have to be very alert and be prepared to move very, very quickly if, if the transaction requires face-to-face -face meetings. 
but we already know of transactions that have been completed without any face-to-face -face meetings at all. Um, so where do we think we are in terms of the effects of the pandemic? I mean, I think we are between phase two and phase three here, um, but I think we're going to be going round in circles. Um, but you know, if you were going to be doing M&A in any industry, um, the good news for all of us is that tech appears to be rising above normal economic recovery, which unlike the V-shape of the tech recovery looks like a U-shape. Um, so lastly, our recommendations. So if you're in a process now, you're well on it, close, close, close. Just get that thing closed. Uh, because despite all the good news, we're still in uncharted territory. Um, if you're considering a sale at the moment, watch very carefully uh, with what's, what's happening. You know, the markets are always coming back. We've seen the NASDAQ coming back, other markets will come back, and that will add extra um, impetus to the M&A environment. Um, if you're actually, if you've actually seen your revenues and your margins being out in, impacted, <clears throat> but already you're seeing that it was a relatively short-term impact, right now, I would actually prepare to go to market in 2021. And you will have seen from the timescales that you know, we're now in August. So you ain't going to be selling until the late spring in next year if all goes according to plan. So yeah, there's a good case that even if you are just starting to recover, you can start to plan to go to market right now. Um, if you happen to be in the industries that have really been <clears throat> hit hard, such as supporting conference venues, part of the music industry or whatever, You've really just got an opportunity to look upon this as an opportunity to make your company resilient. To do those things you may not have done, you know, you may have a few people that are surface requirements and maybe somebody with a pain in the ass you need to get rid of. Um, you know, now's the time to ensure you have a very good remote working platform, get rid of some of those offices, your overheads. Um, but don't go to market unless you absolutely must, because there'll be profound downward pressure on your price, even if in the long term you're a very good strategic buyer buy. Um, but if you're in the lucky position, you know, if you're in um, you know remote working tools um, and you're showing stable, probably increasing revenues, yeah, you know, go to market right now. Uh, there's a lot of unspent money that's chasing deals. Um, and you'll probably get stable or probably frankly increased valuation. Um, because you'll be able to also demonstrate the strength and relevance of your business as the sale process is going on. So that's me, that's my contact numbers should you want to get in touch. I'm now going to pass back to, to Rob and I'm going to start taking you through some of the legal chicanery that can go on around this. Thank you very much Jonathan and, and thank you for taking us through the process from, from your side. Um, me and Gavi, are, are, I'll, I'll just put up our, our slides now, um, which hopefully everyone can see. Now, uh, myself and Gavi are going to talk through sort of what, what comes next uh, after Hampleton's involvement in the process. So, well, not that that's where Hampleton ends, but more where, where we join into the, the sale process or, or even acquisition of a, of a tech business. Now, by way of introduction, myself and Gavi are part of the uh, corporate team at Mackerel Solicitors. So we mostly work with the buying and selling of businesses in all, all sectors, but with recent sales of companies specializing in CBD products, engineering, manufacturing, and software support for the health care sector. Now, a little bit about Mackerel Solicitors for those of you who, who don't know us. Uh, we're a full service law firm based in London. We're able to offer specialist advice on commercial matters. So we work with business property, commercial disputes or corporate transactions such as myself and Gubby. But we also deal with a lot of personal legal matters. So whether that's estate planning, so your wills and trusts, residential property or matrimonial matters to name a few. Now we're also a founding member of Macron International which is an international network of independent law firms based in 60 countries around the world. 
This provides us with invaluable support when working on transactions with an international dimension and is of great assistance to our clients when they need advice quickly, as we can, we usually personally know the lawyers we within the network and you can get a lot further now on a, a recommendation and an email to someone you already know than having to go through the process of finding and vetting a firm in a foreign jurisdiction. Now, myself and Gabby are going to talk through the legal aspects of the sale process with regards to tech businesses. And we're gonna be looking at heads of terms, the legal part of the sale process and considerations for what might come next after you've sold your business. So I'm gonna hand over to Gabby now uh, to talk through the heads of terms. Thanks, Rob. And thank you to everybody who have kindly shared their time with us today. My name is Gavi Sandhu, and I have been helping business owners and entrepreneurs buy and sell businesses for over 15 years. As Rob has said, I'm going to talk about heads of terms and what they are. Uh, lawyers like to use several different phrases for the same thing. So heads of terms will also be called letters of intent, memoranda of understanding and offer letters. They, as I have said, are all one and the same thing, and they paint the picture of what you have agreed with your buyer. You don't have to have them, but they are a useful tool in explaining and or putting together all the emails you might have exchanged and all the conversations you might have had setting out what you're buying and selling. Heads of terms, if you enter into them, are very important <laughs> for two reasons. First reason, and I always ask this question, is, well, Gavi, if heads of terms aren't legally binding, what on earth are we wasting our time for? The answer is, as I said earlier, they are a reference point for people and clients and all the parties to identify what's been agreed. A recent example of that is we had a very, very comprehensive set of terms, and the buyer uh, very kindly wrote to the sellers and said, can we change uh, some of the criteria because we can't remember what we've agreed. And naturally the criteria, the alteration was in favor of the buyer. Uh, we, uh, we produced the heads of terms and said, well, here's a little uh, reminder, an aid memoir of what we've said. So they serve as a morally binding obligation, i.e. this is what we've agreed and this is what we have, uh, what we have decided to do. Now, I know Jonathan will always, in his transactions, specify controls in heads of terms and letters of intent. So now I'm going to talk about what they uh, have in them. And there are three topics, exclusivity, confidentiality, and timeline. They are the most important areas in heads of terms. And exclusivity and confidential confidentiality are the bits in the heads of terms that are legally binding. I know we spoke a little while ago about them not being legally binding, but you, you are at liberty to set out what exactly is legally binding and what isn't. So what does exclusivity do? Well, if we have uh, joined Jonathan and joined the sellers in the journey to sell, a buyer will want to say that we aren't allowed to talk to anybody else for a certain period of time. And this is acceptable because the buyer will want to ensure that we aren't using them as a stalking horse. So they're running around spending lots of time and lots of money looking at our business. In the background, we've been talking to somebody else. The answer to that is we shouldn't be doing that because that, quite frankly, is unfair. Now, in a, specifically in tech businesses, you'll have two subsets of why exclusivity and how we control it is very important. The first reason is you do not want to be entering into exclusivity with a buyer knowing that there are three, four or five other potential bidders looking at your tech and you can't talk to them. The reason for that is we are all human beings and over time, if other bid parties are being excluded, their attention will wander and they will look at something else and you may well uh, not be on their radar anymore. So how do we solve that? Well, if we do have three, four or five different bid parties, our answer to a buyer is, we understand that you are going to spend some time and some cost on looking at our business. And we will agree with you, dear buyer, because you do know there are other people waiting in the wings that we are still allowed to talk to them, but we will only sell to you in that period of time. Now, again, as I said earlier, lawyers, we all like, lawyers love to use 
different uh, phrases for the same thing, but that's called a lockout clause and is slightly different from exclusivity. The second subset is if you are in exclusivity with a buyer, and this is particularly important in a tech business, we will want to say, and it goes back to the controls I mentioned earlier that Jonathan will introduce, is that dear buyer, if you do alter the terms of the deal, then exclusivity will end immediately because you aren't the buyer we thought you were. And if you had presented this set of deal terms at the start of our negotiations, we wouldn't be talking with you, let alone entering into heads of terms. Now, that's, again, I, I, in the context of a tech business, you want to make sure that your controls are as, much, are as ironclad as possible because you do not want a buyer looking at your tech, working out, or potentially even being able to reverse engineer your tech and then saying, well, actually, we aren't buying what we thought we, we were buying. So control of exclusivity is very important in any transaction and particularly acute in a tech deal. The second most important element of heads of terms is confidentiality. And that is because you do not want your buyer to be talking to anybody else saying that your business is on the market because two key reasons first of all uh, chinese whispers always mean that it will go back to your employees now it's okay if it goes back to your senior management if they are already in the loop but to go to your broader employees may mean that you're risking destabilizing your business when the money is not in your bank and that is the key for completion. Is the money in your bank? The second bit is if other people in your sector know you are for sale, that demeans the value you might be able to place on your business. I'm not talking about the financials. Again, I'm talking about the control you can display when you are selling to your particular buyer. Now, what's good for the goose should always be good for the gander and your buyer will always state that we sellers should equally not be talking to anybody else because if other parties or other people in your sector know that you have a potential bid party questions will be asked whether that bid party is acquiring you for greater market share or are they growing by acquisition because they can't grow organically now, the third bit, and this is the least, uh, or rather one of the um, least considerations, least valuable considerations you should be having in heads of terms is the timeline. When you are in a sale process, as Jonathan has already kindly set out, your timeline must be very clear because again, the longer you take to sell your business, if you have decided to enter into exclusivity and not lock out, your potential other bid parties will wander and start talking to other people. The longer you are locked in with a buyer, the more scope they have for trying to alter the deal terms on the basis that you have lost your other bid parties. So again, it goes back to the control that you must display when you are selling your business. Now, in every other webinar I have undertaken, I always say that I, I never give away all the secrets and this is no different. You won't get all the secrets on the webinar, but if you do have any questions, please do send Jonathan, Rob or myself a message and we will do all we can to help you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, so I'll be just then talking through the key stages in the sale process and how these can affect your, the sale of your tech business and, and things to consider as you go into the process that might make it a little bit easier or sort of take some of the pressure away at least. Now, due diligence is, is one that everyone sort of tends to hear about as a, a big time intensive, um, laborious part of the sale process. It's, it's very important in all commercial transactions, but even more so for business sales. And, and then even more so again for tech business sales, where the volume of specialist information about your product or service can be even more substantial and even more complex. Due diligence itself helps a buyer understand the risks and liabilities in a business 
and get a feel for how it works and what its potential might be in the future. But it, as I've said before, it's, it's really intensive for sellers where you, as Jonathan says, have already devoted 120% of your time to building and managing and running this business. You've got to find the time to then explain that to someone else and give them all the documentation that helps them understand what it is that your business does. So once you've agreed a sale, you'll likely receive a lot of questions relating to the legal aspects of the business, the financial performance, tax matters, along with then targeted questionnaires looking at specialist areas of like technology or commercial matters as they relate to what your business does. So going into this process, what are some things to consider that might make it a little bit simpler or at least make a buyer a little bit more comfortable with the information you're providing. Firstly, it's how is your intellectual property and your unique selling point protected? Uh, Jonathan touched on this, but what do you have in place? Are you using confidentiality agreements with customers and employees? Have you registered trademarks or word marks or even patents? And things like this, even if you don't do them, it's good to know, have thought about it and be able to justify to a buyer why you don't do these things to protect your intellectual property or, or your processes so that they can get better understanding of the, the way you manage risk in the business. Particularly if you develop software, do your contracts with programmers and developers ensure what they create is the property of the company. This goes to all aspects of, of what your employees do in a business. And it's amazing how often this is left out of employment contracts, particularly where you, they are developing things on a daily basis, whether that's new products or new processes to make your manufacturing more efficient. It's incredibly important that those rights are over that those processes products software are vested in the business rather than being able to be taken away with them when they leave as a point for both showcasing what your business can do and also making the process easier it's good to consider how much you're going to get employees and your management team involved in the sale having an effective management team has benefits far and beyond the due diligence process but it, also it's a good way of making sure that a buyer can understand what comes next who they're going to be working with and what the potential is with the team that you've built finally it's important to just identify all the software you use and the software you create if this is a key part of your business you need to be able to identify where it's come from who's made it and that you that you are the valid owner of that software this can cause all kinds of problems later on if it's not something you've taken the time to do and it's not something you want interrupting the rest of the sale process. So taking some time to just almost run an audit of what it is you have on your systems can save a lot of time and stress later on. Now, disclosure is often a, a slightly smaller, um, more focused uh, pro process to due diligence. However, it, it retreads a lot of the information you're already provided and allows a buyer to identify areas of potential exposure. Now, this is a stage where you would need to be upfront and as frank as possible about the risks faced by your business. If you, the more frank you are, the more upfront you are, you get to control the narrative around a risk by showing what you are doing about it rather than what the risk and the liability is. One way or another, that area of risk or liability is going to be revealed whether it's pre-sale or post-sale and certainly pre-sale it risks derailing any chance of a completion or certainly limiting the offer that was actually now was initially placed on the table to avoid wasting time and fees it's best to lose an inappropriate buyer who maybe doesn't fully understand the risk that you're trying to explain to them than, and then find someone who is more understanding of the business and the industry and therefore more appropriate and likely to complete a purchase. Now, I mentioned agreeing documents as well. This is the core part of the legal process. It involves negotiating of the sale terms, past what you've already put out in the heads of terms, and agreement of a final share purchase agreement in relation to your business if you're selling a limited company. Depending on the outcome of the two processes above, due diligence and disclosure, this could deviate heavily from the heads of terms you might have agreed initially and, 
as a result of changing risks, changing markets, particularly deals that were going through over the course of lockdown, it can the final result can be very different from what you'd initially intended. This process is also going to involve any agreements for your ongoing employment or consultancy to the business, which is crucial where it's a business owned and managed by you. How far you've gone to establish a management team and de delegate development of your technology is going to heavily influence the, the kind of role you have post-sale. The bigger the management team, the better your employees are at, at developing your processes, the more likely it is that you'll be able to step away with a more of a clean break. And contrary to other businesses, if you're working in the tech sector, these documents are gonna include a lot of information about the products or processes that make your business unique and therefore need specialist advice to prepare and negotiate. Particularly when it comes to software, referencing the source code and how it's protected and accessed will be key for any buyer to make sure that what they're getting is adequately protected. Finally, as, as a stage in the process, it's completion. This could be three months, six months, 12 months, even longer after you signed your heads of terms with a prospective buyer. This is the day where you might have attended our office to sign all the documents needed to formally conclude the sale. Although in the current circumstances, you're more likely to sign all of these documents virtually, either from home or, or from your own business offices, which can take a little bit away from the, the gravitas of finally completing your sale. Once signatures documents are dated and the purchase price is paid, the buyer can begin the process of establishing themselves in the business, which, as I said before, could be something you're heavily involved in or something you, you're, you leave your management team to deal with. So overall, selling a business is not easy, as, as we've said before, and it can involve lots, months of late nights, weekends lost, and additional stress on top of all those things that you'll lose from running your business in the first place. It does, however, come to an end, usually successfully, and there are always things you can do to spread the workload. And as I've said before, involvement of management team and key employees is really important for doing that. At every stage, it's important to ensure you have help and that you can talk to those around you, whether it's partners, business partners, staff or advisors, so that you've got a good network of support, which makes all the difference in your experience of the process. Uh, finally, I'm just going to touch on what comes next. These are just a few common post completion plan examples and all areas where financial and legal advice can be beneficial. Before and after a sale, us at Mackerel and I'm sure Jonathan at Hampleton and partners as well, are always happy to put you in touch with the right specialist advisors and help you consider the legal aspects of what comes next. So I know we've, we've run a bit close to the mark, so I'm going to put us, we'll have time for a couple of questions and then any further questions that you may have, please do feel free to send us an email and we'd be happy to arrange discussion after the webinar. So one that I can see here that we've got is for Jonathan. So Jonathan, when putting together a buyer list, how big should it be and how many different types would you, would you go for? Um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, my, my view would be, I got touched on this when I was talking, would be that, you know, you're looking probably for, um, you know, 60 to 70 uh, potential buyers um, in maybe four to five different groups, you know, and, and of that 60 to 70, maybe, you know, 10 are going to be private equities and the rest will be strategic buyers. But again, it's not, it's, you know, that's where I start to feel comfortable that uh, all the potential were thought enough about all the potential buyers. And I think it's one of the things which often m and people don't do well enough. They don't think about um, tangential sectors. I mean, we recently sold uh, an automotive um, automation platform company uh, to an insurer when I think the advice the company had been receiving for quite a while had been that the natural place for that coming to be sold to would be another OEM. And in fact, the insurers, because they have particular problems that company will solve, were prepared to pay way more for that company than the OEMs. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I've got another one, I think, probably for Gubby. Uh, how could a buyer tie a selling shareholder into the earnout if, if they could do that? Thanks, Rob. What you'll find is um, 
if you have a financial buyer, as Jonathan kindly uh, explained earlier on in the presentation, they are likely to want to be owners and not operators. So they will want any future uh, money that is paid to you as selling shareholders after completion, it is likely that you or other their lawyers will introduce what's called bad lever, good lever. And depending on, on what is in, depending on what's negotiated, if you wake up as an ongoing shareholder and you wake up three days after completion, you say, well, actually, um, I've got enough money in my bank balance now, in my bank, the balance is very healthy. Uh, I'm off to sit on a yacht in the Maldives for a couple of years. Your private equity buyer stroke financial buyer is likely to say, well, that's all very well and good, but your right to any future money is terminated. And the opposite of that is if, if you are made redundant or if you are uh, seriously ill or, or if um, the worst should happen, then you probably will be termed a good lever and even though you are no longer with the business, your right to receive future money will be retained. Okay, thanks, Gary. And so I've got another one here. So uh, has there been any change to the terms of a deal due to COVID, such as less cash up front, more stock, more clauses, etc.? cetera? Um, so I'll, 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 I'll open this up to, to Gabby and um, Jonathan in a moment, but certainly from our experience over the last few months, there was a lot of deal changes early in lockdown. We had transactions where, where buyers stepped away to focus on their own businesses if they were operating in similar industries or private equity houses were just stepping back from, from all acquisitions generally or even stepping back from the businesses they were already investing in. So there's always scope for those changes to come into effect. A lot of it's going to depend on the pressure that's already on the sellers to sell if they're really keen on, on getting out of the business by a certain date or if the buyer is, has got a lot of leverage in terms of the, the options that are on the table to those sellers. I mean, Jonathan, Gabby, did you have any particular examples that you wanted to share? No, I'd, I'd agree very much with what you what you said. I mean, I think when COVID hit, uh, which is really talking about sort of April May time, um, a lot of you know there were buyers that put their track that put things on hold. There were buyers that slowed things down. Um, we didn't see much anything, or very little in the way of, of price chipping. It was what we were seeing was essentially businesses going okay got a big problem here we're going to have to look at our own operations um, and we'll come back to that acquisition a little bit later um, now that and that, and that would you now coincided with a big drop in activity which you saw in my slides earlier on um, uh, now we're not seeing it P people have got used to the new normal and, uh, and are moving ahead as they, as they can it's, it's you know, I can't overemphasize that people have uh, have realized that since the financial crash, technology is now stitched into every aspect of the global economy. Um, so it's a fact of life. If you want to run any business, you're going to have to keep innovating uh, in technology. So the buyers are still going to be buying. It's where all the, um, the, the, the surveys are saying at the moment, if there's any retraining uh, in organizations, it's going to have to be in IT. Um, so, you know, we think things have pretty much come back to normal. Um, and, you know, as we're seeing, uh, that means that in certain sectors, we're seeing profound increases in, in, um, in valuation. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, so I'll go with a, uh, probably a time for sort of a final question. I know I'm conscious that we've, we've overrun a little bit as well. Um, so probably one for you again, Jonathan, actually, should you tell your employees that you're going to sell your business? Uh, right. Um, well, I think the answer is certainly not in the early stages of, of, of the transaction process, you know, other than, than those people who've, already, who've made the transaction decision with you in the board, um, because it, it, will it will do nothing but create uncertainty and will increase your word workloads. You have to put in extra communications, HR have to get involved at a time when you're going to be flat out anyway. Um, it could also cause an upspike in people leaving. Um, 
whenever you have a change in the company, you get a lot of irrational fear amongst employees, and that in turn will introduce risk to the buyer. Um, and also, frankly, if you're being acquired by a publicly traded body, uh, secrecy is vital, lest rumours start to creep out and there's un unusual share movements, and you have to start dealing with regulatory authorities. I mean, I would always use signed NDAs, non disclosure agreements, um, uh, and only bring pro people into the process that are necessary to complete that process. But you must ensure you've got a full communications and integration plan ready to implement at the point of sale. And of course, a crisis management plan uh, ready if news does leak out. Um, you know, you've got to ensure the company looks like it's running business as usual and any unusual absences of key executives, there's a really good cover story. Um, and the other thing I would always say, and it's sort of this, this stuff of drama, is that as every transaction project should have a code name and people should seriously talk about the thing with that code name at all times. Um, and that you'll, you actually act on any duty that you have to inform clients um, of a transaction if that requirement is contained in your contract with them. So I would review all your sales contracts because often that clause will be in there, uh, particularly, you know, when you really have partner relationships with companies that, you know, you're both dependent on each other's goodwill and progress. So, you know, just make sure that you tell the right people in the right time scale. Yeah, we absolutely agree with you there, Jonathan. And it's certainly where we've dealt with transactions with employee shareholders. They need to be involved in the process, but they are, everyone's a lot more comfortable once the deal terms are more certain and then it's clearer what they're getting and what they're being involved in and that the buyer's committed to the transaction rather than worrying people unnecessarily and then a, a deal falls away and it's a new buyer it's, it's easier to get people on board once it's all definitely going ahead sort of in the final days or weeks of a transaction. Yeah, everybody loves certainty. So, Absolutely. you know, until, until you're 99% certain, you're quiet. Yeah. Um, so if, if you do have any other questions, please do feel free to send us an email. Our contact details are on screen and, and available online as well. Um, one final question was just, this has been recorded, so we will be posting a link to the full recording online, which feel free to view and share. Um, and then we'll probably be posting some of the excerpts up as well um, once we've had the time to edit those. So all I have to say is um, thank you very much to Jonathan for joining us and, and thank you all for, for coming online to, to listen to our webinar. And uh, we look forward to speaking with you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.